Hello everyone, how are we all doing today? Let me know if you guys can hear me okay, if the sound is okay. Let me know as always if you need more or less of anything on your end. Hey Quicksilver, how's it going? I can see you over there in the chat. Number one, hasn't there already been two of these? Yes, there has, there has been two live streams. But the reason there's a number one in the title of today is because tonight is a very specific type of live stream that I'm gonna be doing probably one a month of these kind of things. So this is the first of this thing, which is basically a sort of tips and tricks kind of guitar Q and A session. So one of the topics that came up quite a lot when I asked on socials about, you know, what, uh, what people wanted to see in the live streams, one thing that came up a lot was the idea of doing some tuition based stuff. So I thought I'd put this stream together once a month where you guys can, you know, submit questions. I can help you guys out with whatever guitar related problems you might be having. Uh, volume low on your microphone. How is that, Peter? Is that better? Is that loud enough? Let me know if you need a bit more. I can always try and bump it up a bit more on my end. <laughs> when can I win a peer? Um, that is a good question. Uh, I don't have a date for that one yet, unfortunately. That is a giveaway that isn't yet on the table, but, uh, you know, maybe one day. Uh, voice volume may be a bit low. How's that, guys? I've bumped it up a little bit more. Is that better? Let me know. A little bit of gain on the mic there, Chief. I've just bumped the gain up a little bit. Just turn it down on my headphones. That should be... A bit more? Anyone need a bit more? How's that? Much better. Cool. So yeah, uh, I've been asking around on social media if anyone's got any guitar questions. So basically things you're learning, things you're stuck on. This is going to be a regular session where we can get together and talk about those things. So throw them in the chat while I get caught up with what's going on over there. So hey Dennis, how are you doing? All great great sound and video that's good and I do have to say before we get too deep anyone who was here last week for the 5k giveaway I just want to apologize because the stream cut off really suddenly uh, for some reason last week my internet connection just gave up so I think we were like in the last uh, maybe 10 minutes of the stream and I carried on streaming but it seems like the stream didn't reach YouTube. So there was a whole five or 10 minutes of me talking about the giveaway after we'd given all the prizes away last week that just you guys didn't see. Um, so yeah, for some reason there was a big disconnect. My, I think my Wi-Fi went down and yeah, the last 10 minutes of the stream were completely wiped out. I was here doing the stream, but you guys didn't see it. So apologies if you were, uh, you know, if you were here last week and you were suddenly cut off. But this week, I think we're working with a, a bit of a better connection. So touch wood, all goes to plan. Okay, so now the sound is better. Let's get into the comments. Uh, Nicholas, hey, how's everything going? I'm good, Nicholas. Thank you very much. How are you today? We all thought, wow, manners. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm really sorry. Uh, I did post a comment. I pinned a comment on the video when I realized as well. Um, yeah. Just one of those annoying things and I, I thought by that point it was a little bit pointless in me reconnecting for the stream because I figured most people had probably gone by that point so I thought oh do you know what I'll just put a post out to say sorry <laughs> but uh, yeah my my internet decided to betray me last week and yeah it is the joys of live broadcasting <laughs> so yeah how is everyone doing out there today how are all you guys doing um for anyone who's just joined in the last couple of minutes like i said we're going to be doing these sessions regularly probably once a month uh where we're going to talk about guitar playing and learning so anyone who doesn't know much of my history i come from a, a musical education background i have taught guitar for many years uh, i run an online guitar course and all other sort of educational avenues with guitar one thing I get asked a lot about on social media is just different tips and tricks. So I thought it'd be really cool to come together once a month and basically explore a bunch of this stuff in a live forum. So a few people have sent a few things in on social media that they wanted to talk about, but this is 
you know, this is a real open forum. So if there's anything you guys are working on, anything you guys are stuck on or want to talk about, let's do it. You know, let's talk education, let's talk learning, let's talk scales, technique, let's talk whatever you want. This, this is completely open, so throw them whatever questions or queries or problems you have, put those in the comments and yeah, we'll work through them. And obviously anyone who puts a question in the comments as well, I'm sure there'll be people in the comments offering their two cents about this as well. So really the whole point of this is just a bit of a, you know, a bit of an open educational discussion forum, if you will. So yeah, let's, uh, let's talk. So Quicksilver, I have a question about technique. Yeah, let's do it. What, what's your, what's your technique question? Let's hear what your, what technique you're working on or what technique you're stuck on. Let's talk about that. Okay, so what is a good practice plan? I need all the help I can get. Finally learning at 60 to play, anything to catch up? That's a good question, Dennis. So whenever I work with students and I talk about practice plans, the, the big kind of takeaway I think from a practice plan is that you should never kind of over practice things that don't benefit you. So one thing a lot of people struggle with, uh, maybe, I mean, obviously if you're learning at 60, it depends if you're still working full time or if you have a job, but obviously one thing people contend with a lot when they're learning, especially in their adult years is juggling the learning process with, you know, day-to-day -day life, regular life, work, family commitments, all of that stuff. So whenever I'm putting a practice plan together for students, I always like to try and figure out, you know, how their life is around the guitar. So how much free time do you have and what sort of stuff are you looking to learn? And then obviously we can put a bit of a plan together for you then that will really benefit you because I think you can get a lot done in a very little time if you're practicing the right stuff. And that's really the, the sort of key takeaway from that is practicing the right things, not just practicing for the sake of it, but you know, playing the correct stuff. So yeah, let me know, you know, what your sort of, you know, time availability is and, and that kind of stuff. And then yeah, I'll throw some tips at you. Quicksilver, I have the grip of a silverback gorilla when I strum a chord. Okay, so, uh, do you think I should practice a lighter touch or go up a gauge from 10 to 11? I would personally, I would instantly recommend uh, working on the touch. And the reason I say this is because I personally am someone who comes from a background of being a really heavy handed player. So when I first started playing guitar, um, I had like a cheap little 10 watt practice amp that I blew up within a few weeks. And the only way I could then get my guitar to sound, you know, like all the sort of the rock records I was trying to learn was to play harder. So as a result, I sort of developed this really bad habit of playing really like, you know, squeezing the life out of the frets, hammering the, the strings. And over the course of, you know, 10, 15 years that I was doing that, I ended up developing really bad tendonitis in my wrist. So I would always recommend the lighter touch purely because you know there's only so hard we need to play uh, there's only so hard we need to press down with the guitar so this is kind of a a back to basics thought process so let's say we're playing the fifth fret on the d string okay how hard do we need to push this down so a good way to practice your lighter touch is to pick a note anywhere on the fretboard i'm going to use the fifth fret of the d and i'm just going to rest my finger on it now that's muted, so there's no note coming out there. And then just gradually apply pressure until you find the point where the note sounds. That will probably be at least half of the intensity you're probably playing with if you're sort of anything like me technique wise. So really the frets of the guitar are the point where you need to press down to. You don't need to press down to the fretboard. Now what you may find is if you do press down really hard, you can actually bend notes out of tune. So if I play that same note and then I apply excess pressure, hear that little pitch increase? That's what you don't want. So that could be one of the reasons your chords aren't quite working because what you're essentially doing there is you're bending the notes out of tune by pushing them beyond where the point of contact with the frets is. 
So yeah, I would say practice a light attach. Uh, the best way to do that is to get used to, first of all, just how light you need to touch. And then just doing things like, you know, running scales, pentatonic scales, but just with a really light touch. Just get used to essentially pushing the string down until it naturally stops. Same with chords, whatever chord you're working on, work on each note, like let's say I'm doing a G chord, I'm gonna do the same principle, but I'm gonna rest all my fingers above the notes. So the, the fretted notes will all be muted. And then I'm gonna push those down until the point where they just start to ring. That's the point where you need to actually press them down to. Obviously when you're retraining yourself to play with a lighter touch, it can take a while and it can be quite frustrating. Um, but yeah, just do a little bit of that every day. And after a week or so, you'll probably find that your touch naturally start and starts to lighten. That is one thing that really helped me out. You do have to make a conscious effort with touch, I think. It's uh, quite uh, an annoying thing to get out of. I can attest to that because I had to do the same thing myself or risk my wrist being completely knackered. So yeah, hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, but yeah, just ease off a little bit. Um, just try to get used to not applying as much pressure. If you can feel it in your arm, you know there's a problem. Peter, I'll spend an afternoon learning a song, but the next day I've forgotten all the chord changes. Yeah, that's, that's something that I, uh, I struggled with that for a long time. When I first got into sort of doing a lot of gigs with different bands, I was always learning different set lists. What I found really helped me was trying to find a pattern in the chords. So if I'm playing a song, like let's say the song is going A, D, E. What I would do is I would look for a pattern within that. So instead of trying to remember the song or the, the chords of the song as it were, I would remember where the first chord is, so my A, and then I would essentially try and remember that, okay, my next chord is below it. The next chord is two frets up from that. Obviously you're trying to find patterns within the fretboard. For me, that helped me kind of learn a lot of songs quickly because I could sort of visualize them as patterns of movement then rather than trying to remember different chords. I'm sort of thinking in terms of like, oh, it's here, then it's here, then it's here. Uh, obviously in terms of, you know, forgetting the chords and forgetting the song, one of the best things you can do there is repetition. There is a type of learning which is known as micro learning. And this is something that I'm a big, big fan of, which is when you learn one thing in 10 or 15 minutes, you spend a you know, short session of time learning something, but learn it really intensely, like really focus on that one thing. Then the next day, learn it again and keep learning that one thing. And the rule of micro learning sort of dictates that after you do that three or four times, you should in theory then remember it. So if you do find that you forget a song by the next day, learn it again the next day. And while this can be quite frustrating, once you've done it a few times, the song will then stick. Um, and what this will do is this will build up your, your sort of overall muscle memory sort of um, like abilities. So when you're then learning songs, after you've sort of micro learned a few different songs, you should then find the song learning process speeds up because your brain will naturally start to make those connections quicker. So yeah, give that a try. Maybe pick a song, you know, learn it every day until it really sticks and then add another song and maybe after two or three songs, that time will go from four or five days to three days and then your song learning capabilities are on the improvement or on the up, I should say. That, that sentence didn't make any sense, did it? Anton, how many hours playing would you suggest before changing strings? Tone reduces so gradually that I don't notice until I change strings. I keep them clean so not a visual prompt to change. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I change strings pretty frequently uh, on guitars that I gig a lot. So if I'm out playing live uh, and I know I'm going to be using the same guitar for like you know, two months worth of gigs over the, which might be like 12 gigs across a eight week period. I'll probably change the strings after half of those gigs if I'm gonna be using the same guitar. At the moment, I've got a few guitars that are in rotation. So I probably change each set of strings maybe once every three months. 
on each guitar or guitars that I use regularly. Um, I get what you're saying though about you don't notice the tone until you do change them because I get that as well. I'll sometimes be playing the guitar and think, I mean, this is a good example. I know I haven't changed the strings on this guitar for probably five months, um, but they still sound good. But I know if I put new strings on it, it would sound brighter. So yeah, it's a tricky one. Uh, I tend to just try and trust my instincts with that. I just sort of play a set and kind of think, okay, these feel like they're maybe not gonna last me too much longer. Uh, but yeah, as a rule for me, depending on how much you play them, three months. If you've got one guitar that you play every single day, I would maybe even go as far as to say every six weeks or, I mean, I've been known to change strings every day on a tour in the past. I did a, a three week tour a few years ago and I changed strings every single day because I was just like playing so hard at that point that the strings were noticeably deteriorated by the end of each show. So yeah, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's, a, it's an open-ended question, but as often as you think you need to change them, and I know that doesn't really help too much, but yeah, just trust your instinct. Uh, if you play the guitar all the time, maybe more frequently. And if it's a guitar you play infrequently amongst other guitars, maybe once every three months. That's usually what I go for. Ah, uh, Michelle's here as well. Hey, Michelle, how you doing? I have banana hands, though, like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, I think... Anyone can learn a light touch, or again, if, if you're really struggling with a light touch, you could go down the road of heavier strings. Uh, the, to me, the disadvantage of doing that is you're not addressing tension issues in the hands. So I always think if you're playing aggressively or you're playing really hard with, with sort of bad technique and you're applying too much tension, that can catch up with you over time. Because for me personally, I did that for years. I didn't ever think it was a problem until it became a problem. And then one day applying pressure meant I was getting shooting pains up the arm and in the wrist. And then I knew I was in trouble. And I knew that was because of too much tension with my fretting hand especially. So yeah, it's, it's tricky. Uh, I did have to go through a, probably a two or three month period of kind of relearning how to play and readjusting everything I thought I knew. Um, but it's definitely worth it. I would definitely advise going down the tension and light touch route before anything else. But yeah, if you're really struggling with it, you could kind of compromise by changing your string gauge now. But then going up a string gauge, there's more tension in the strings, which can then make you play harder because there's more tension in the strings. So you can see it's, uh, it's a tricky one. If anything, you should probably go down a string gauge to encourage you to play lighter because the lighter strings aren't gonna be as tolerant as of you playing heavier. So if anything, yeah, maybe go down to a set of nines, even if they, they may not feel very comfortable because they're gonna be so thin, but the fact that they're so thin is gonna stop you from, you know, using too much tension on them. Dennis, love rock and blues, full-time studio. I'm retired, I uh, have everything I need, so grateful, thanks for your help. Okay, cool, so in that case then, if you've got an open palette of time for practicing, that gives a lot of options of what you can do. So, from a rock and blues perspective, uh, the first thing I would focus on is just making sure all my basic, I, I, I'm using the assumption that you're fairly new to playing again, uh, so I would make sure I've got all the basics completely nailed. So chords are sounding clean. Your sort of coordination is pretty good between your hands. If I was focusing solely on being a rock and blues player and I had an open palette of time to learn, I would still maybe approach pract uh, practicing in some more sort of, um, what's the word we're looking for here? Sort of like compartmentalized things so sort of um, maybe focus a portion of your day on specific tasks so instead of just practicing all day split out the time you're playing into time you're going to really work and time you're just going to play for fun so again you could play 15 minutes three times a day of solid work 
So for 15 minutes in the morning, you're going to practice scales. 15 minutes in the afternoon, you're going to practice technique, so string bends, hammer-ons, pull-offs. Then maybe 15 minutes in the evening, you're going to practice maybe music theory or chord progressions or another thing you're going to focus on for 15 minutes. And then throughout the rest of the day, you're just going to play for fun. So practice it, or not so much practicing, but just playing the things you know and having fun with it. Um, if you've got all day, I would say break up your practice sessions. So instead of sitting there for six hours, solidly working on one thing, break that thing up into smaller sort of sessions. Uh, people tend to learn quicker when they focus on something more intensely for a short period of time. Uh, I always liken this to the way a runner would train for a marathon. A runner is not just gonna go out the door and run for 28 miles. They're gonna run a few miles every day, building up to the marathon. So think of the guitar as the same thing. You wanna do those shorter sessions that you're really focusing on how you're doing things with the goal of putting it together in a big way at the end. If there's specific things you're working on, obviously throw those in the comments as well. Peter, I like the sound of this micro learning. We'll let you know if it helps. Yeah, it's an interesting um, learning theory. I picked it up from an old job when I was working for a, a corporate sort of company. I was in the sort of training department. And that was one of the things we used to sort of sort of apply was micro learning. So getting people to do the same thing over and over again in short periods of time. We found that that worked better for people retaining information than just saying, you know, read this big thing for three hours and then, you know, expect someone to know how to do it. I've always been confused as to why I can't remember a song until it starts and then I know all the parts somehow, not perfectly like Paul Gilbert, just close. Do you know what? I get that every gig. Um, <laughs> I've had gigs where I've played songs that if you asked me what the first chord was, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. And as soon as you hear the count in, somehow it's just there. It's like there's this sort of primal thing that guitar players have in the back of our mind. And I guess other musicians probably experience this as well. Where you've got this thing in the back of your mind that, you know, it retains all the information, but you couldn't call that information out if you wanted to. But just somehow, in the heat of the moment, there it is. There's, there's the chord you're looking for. Leon just waits until he snaps a string and then changes them. Admittedly, I do that with some guitars. Um, guitars I don't play as frequently as others, I won't go out of my way to change strings on. Even if the tone does suffer slightly, I will persevere until uh, until the string goes pop. But yeah, it's it's all subjective. And, and strings are getting expensive. Strings are getting very expensive these days as well, so it's not as easy to keep your guitars freshly strung as it used to be. When I first started playing, strings were like £4 a pack, and now they're easily double that. They're like £8 in the UK now. So yeah, it's not as easy to keep your guitars freshly strung these days. So what else are you guys working on? Anyone else got any interesting topics they're working on? I've got a few things lined up from social media as well uh, that I'll probably talk about. I don't know if the people that ask those questions are here, um, but there's a few topics in there as well that are worth talking about. So one thing I did get asked uh, on Instagram that I thought was quite interesting was uh, a good friend of mine, Tonio. Uh, he's a guitar player from Germany. I met him at 42 Gear Street and he plays with a really cool rock band called Bouncing Betty. Uh, he asked me, wasn't so much of a question as it was a, a request. He just said the words Eric Johnson. And um, Tony is a great player, but he I, I guess he's asking for some Eric Johnston style guitar tips. Now, I've always said I'm not the kind of player that would be able to tackle Eric Johnston's guitar style, but there is a really cool Eric Johnston style trick that I sort of picked up um, that is quite fun actually to, to implement. And, and I think this is really cool in like a rock and blues perspective, which is the idea of like note groupings. Note groupings, whenever we play lead guitar, we always think in even numbers. So we either think of one note on a beat, which isn't an even number, but it's a singular, or we think of two notes on a beat or four notes on a beat. Very occasionally we'll branch off into triplets. But Eric Johnston works in fives. And fives is really interesting because if you're playing a pentatonic lick, like we all know the sound of a, a minor pentatonic scale in groups of fours. <laughs> But 
but Eric Johnson would play which has a slightly different sort of cascading effect to it and what I'm actually doing there is I'm just playing the same scale E minor pentatonic but in groups of five and this is about the the limit of my <laughs> Eric Johnson understanding and and ability but I think this is a really interesting thing to try and use if you're getting into like blues and rock improvisation is thinking in slightly odd numbers so I'm still playing like a bar of 4-4 four, four for argument's sake but I'm actually playing five notes on a beat so my first beat would be which is five notes one two three four five then my second beat third beat fourth beat and then we could end on the root this sounds pretty cool when you get it sped up and what this also encourages you to do is it actually encourages you to think about the picking of that as well because what we're doing there is we're doing alternate picking but rending on a downstroke. Now we actually need to use a technique there called economy picking which is actually when we then go to the next grouping with another down so it's going to be down up down up down which is alternate but to make the next group flow I've got to start that with a down as well so it's So I'm doing these two consecutive downstrokes in this sort of mini sweep. That is about as far as my Eric Johnson knowledge goes, but I thought that was a good a good question from Tonio. Um, it's a fun thing to do. I've started trying to implement it in my playing with varying degrees of success. So yeah, if any of you guys try and play in five five notes over a four beat, let me know how you get on with that one because it's it's quite tricky to get used to. It's a, a bit of a brain trainer at first. Quicksilver, I keep my strings on until they blend in with the ebony fretboard. Those strings must be ruined by that point. Uh, so I had some other questions over on Instagram. Uh, okay, so what scales to use was one of the questions. So scales from a learning perspective are, in my opinion, scales are there just to give us ideas or I like to think of scales as like tools or sort of options. So I know it's really easy when you start playing lead guitar to get really bogged down in the idea of scales being, you know, I have to play the scale this way. I have to play these notes in this order. But I always think of scales as options. So if you're playing, you know, in A minor, just because you're playing an A minor, it doesn't mean you only have to play A minor pentatonic. So really the answer to what scales to use is, it depends what you're trying to do with those scales. So the way my brain is kind of wired because of the way my musical upbringing happened and the bands I got into when I was young, I think in minor pentatonic. I always just think of, that's my, my starting point for everything. But then, Around that, I'll start to think, okay, what am I trying to convey with this with this thing? So I use pentatonic as a framework, and then I insert different things inside of that to convey different sort of sounds or different emotions. So what's, what scale to use would really depend on what I'm trying to play. So if I'm playing, you know, a very minor key thing... then I would probably stick pretty pentatonic, but I would maybe delve into like the natural minor scale, which is also one of the modes. Uh, that's where we just add, so for instance in A, we're adding two additional notes to the scale. Because those extra notes just allow you a different level of expression. So you could still play pentatonic licks. And then we've got these sort of interesting I think of these notes as like coloration, like you can find these extra notes. That aren't your expected pentatonic notes, but they, they're they interesting to hear over a chord progression. So yeah, very contextual. Um, I can't remember who asked that question, I should have written it down, but if you are here watching and you did ask me the question of what scales to use, let me know what you're trying to play over and maybe I can give you a bit more of a specific answer. 
Halls of 5000, what were the first things you started learning when you first picked up the guitar? So when I first started learning, it was all about sort of 60s and 70s British rock, which is quite unusual for someone of the age I was when I started, because I started playing when I was 12. Uh, there's not many 12 year olds who are, you know, sort of obsessed with Eric Clapton. But when I first started playing, it was all about, you know, sort of cream. And Led Zeppelin as well was a big one for me, just the way Jimmy Page plays. I was obsessed with Page's sort of phrasing style as a lead guitar player. I was just obsessed with the way that he always found notes that were outside of the scale that you'd expect him to play. I always loved that sort of, um, like since, you, since I've been loving you. He would always land on those really interesting, slightly weird notes. So it was a big combination of like Page, Clapton, um, but then I got into things like Iron Maiden uh, and then like 80s hair metal as well by the time I was in my early teens. So it was everything from like, you know, Eric Clapton to, you know, C.C. DeVille from Poison. So it was quite a, quite a wide ranging uh, selection of things that I started learning when I first picked up the guitar, but predominantly pre-90s. Dennis, that sounds great. I will write it down and put it to use. What amp should I use? I have a Spark 40, a Katana Mark 2x12, Katana Mark II 2x12, and a Marshall Code 50. Uh, good question. Um, they're all great amps, all very versatile. All of them do a lot of different things. Uh, I guess really it would depend on what you're practicing at that point. I used to have a Code 50 and even though it models other amps, I definitely found that the Marshall sounds in there were better than the, the sort of the other models. It's a Marshall amp though, obviously what do you expect? Uh, so I would probably maybe even set each amp up for a different sound. That's usually the way I approach amps is I like to just have, uh, you know, an amp for a specific job. So I would probably be using the Marshall for classic rock stuff. I mean, it's a Marshall after all. Uh, the Katana, I know the Katanas have a really great clean sound and um, obviously it's got all the boss effects built in and the Katana's great to pair with pedals. So I would probably, if that was my setup, I'd probably keep the Katana pretty clean. And then the Spark 40, I don't know, I guess I would just use that for a, a bit of everything because it's quite a versatile amp. Uh, I've not played one myself, but I've heard nothing but good things about them. When they, uh, when they start to not stay in tune, I change them. It's a good, good time to change strings. How do I stop using my go-to muscle memory patterns when I improvise? Now that's a good question. That is a really good question. So it's very easy to get stuck on playing, you know, let's say you've got 10 licks that you always play in every key. It's really easy to just play those 10 licks over and over again, as we all know, because we all do it. So what I find really helps me is thinking about the the notes of the lick. Uh, this this was a little bit of a, I guess, an eye opener for me when it came to understanding scales, because I fell into that as well. So let's say let's say my go to lick is A minor pentatonic, and it's this, right? Pretty standard rock lick. We've all probably played that lick a thousand times. What I had a bit of a a light bulb moment with was when I realized I could play the same lick with the same note pitches in a different position and then we're still hearing the lick we expect to hear but it doesn't feel the same so to do that we what we've got to do is we've got to think I suppose there's a little bit of theory in this we've got to think about the notes that we're playing under our fingers so if we're doing this in A minor what we're playing there is we're playing a C note an A note uh, I should know what that is. That's a G note, <laughs> a C note, an A note, a G note, and an E note. I should know that. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna find those same notes, but in a different position. So instead of playing it in pentatonic shape one, I'm gonna take this A note, and I'm gonna put it here on the 10th fret of the B string. And then this E note, on the ninth fret of the G. So instead of playing my muscle memory lick, 
I can play. So it sounds the same. But it feels different. So getting away from that muscle memory feeling but still having the same lick in your ear is quite a big one. That also works in the third shape of the pentatonic. And this is something that I regularly do this myself when I'm playing. Uh, I'll write a lick in the first position. So let's say again, like that. In the third pentatonic position, I can play the same lick, but there's a slight difference in the finger movements. So doing things like that, like thinking about the notes you're playing and then basically working out where you can play the same pitch notes but in a different orientation, that was a big one for me when it comes to breaking out of muscle memory habits. Because yeah, it's very easy to just play the same lick a thousand and one times. Can you advise on the best way to break a bad habit? I tend to mainly only move the fingers for vibrato rather than the rotation of the wrist. It's difficult for me to correct. I really like talking about this topic. Um, vibrato, I think, is one of the most important techniques that a guitar player can learn and especially get to grips with because as a guitar player, your vibrato is sort of your... I guess it's sort of your voice as a guitar player. So all our favorite players have their own vibrato style, which is what makes them quite unique. So the technique that I always use is slightly unconventional, I suppose, but it works for me. And this is the way I always teach people to play vibrato. So what you're saying there is you move your fingers. So let's say I'm doing vibrato on the fifth fret of the G. The vibrato is coming from the finger movement. What I do, my vibrato technique, is instead of my hand, I'm trying to get the camera angle right on this one, instead of my hand being, you know, attached to the back of the neck, allowing me to do the finger vibrato, I hold the neck like this. So my hand is completely locked to the back of the neck. Let's say I'm doing the vibrato with my index finger. So, fifth fret on the G. What I will do is my vibrato will come from here not from here. So I always use this, this is a really weird angle to try and get on camera, this part of my hand here as a pivot on the bottom of the neck. So really what I'm doing is I'm doing this for vibrato. So you'll notice my whole arm is moving. Obviously I'm overextending the, mo the movement here just to show you the movement, but I'm using my entire arm while this bit of my hand stays attached to the guitar. So when you actually play that with a note, I'm holding the guitar like this. My thumb's over the top, my finger's on the fifth of the G. My vibrato is this. So I'm rolling the entire arm from, you know, from the elbow, from the forearm. You could even just do it from the wrist, but I'm rolling away like that. The entire arm is moving. And for me, what that allows me to do is that allows me to really control my vibrato. So if I want to get a really wide vibrato, I can roll the arm further. Now the reason I, I like the control of this is because when I then return my hand to holding the neck normally, my string is back at its normal pitch. So I always find if I do vibrato any other way, there's room for me to bend the string upwards and downwards, which can make it a little bit erratic. Having the hand sort of anchored to the guitar like that, sort of, it sort of acts like a reset point. Like when my hand is back there, the string is back at its normal pitch. So I'm always doing vibrato away from that kind of central pitch, I guess we could refer to that as. So if I want to do a really wide vibrato, I'm going to roll the arm really far. So the movement there is going to be... But you see this pit of my hand here is not coming away from the neck, neither is my thumb. The neck is constantly in my hand. I'm just rolling like that from the side of the knuckle. And then if I want to do a, a narrower vibrato, it's the same motion, I'm just doing less movement. You can also then focus on speed with the vibrato. So if I want to do a faster vibrato, I do the same motion, but quicker. And a slower vibrato. 
So the movement is the same for everything then. The only thing that changes is how fast you do the movement and how far you do the movement. So that for me is a vibrato technique that I quite like to use. Um, I find it just gives me a lot more control over it. It's an easy technique to get into a bad habit with. So yeah, try that. Let me know if that works for you. Ra Dene, I love you playing. Can't believe you only have 5,000 followers. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you to say. Uh, it is growing pretty quick though, which is nice. Uh, obviously we hit 5K two weeks ago, which is really cool. And I believe actually this week, if I remember correctly, is uh, two years this week to the day I started really doing loads of videos on YouTube. So yeah, it's been a busy two years, even though it's, oh, you, you say only 5,000 people, but that's 5,000 people in two years, which I'm very pleased with. So, uh, but thank you for being part of that as well. And maybe by this time next year, there'll be 5,000 more people on the, uh, on the channel as well. My vibrato is like turning a doorknob. Yeah, that's kind of how I look at it as well. It's like a rotation, like the arm is kind of doing this. The, the finger and this part of the hand stay stationary on the guitar, but then we're sort of rotating around that point. It's like a pivot is the way I always think of it. I'm not sure where I picked that up, but I remember someone showed that to me like 10 or 15 years ago and it was just instantly like, why have I not thought about vibrato this way before? It just gives so much more control over the note for me. Um, but yeah, try it, see how, see how that feels. and. Uh, yeah, let me know. Let me know how you get on with that one. So anyone else got any questions? What else are you guys working on or what else are you guys stuck on? Let me check what I was asked over on Instagram because there's been a few things coming in. Uh, so what have we got there? I'm looking through my topic list from people that replied on socials to me. So habitually using the various minor pentatonic positions on all improv solos and any easy tweaks to expand it. So that's a really good question. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the muscle memory thing that we talked about uh, like 10 minutes ago, where it's really easy with pentatonic shapes to just play one of the shapes all the time. And, and any of you guys probably know that because you've probably fallen into the same trap at some point of just playing one shape. When it comes to using all the pentatonic shapes as a habit, the thing that I did that really helped me was I made these connections between different shapes. So licks I could play in the first shape, I connected to the third shape and the second shape to the fourth shape. So I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. But the reason that really helped me is because then I stopped thinking about the pentatonic scale as shapes and I started thinking how it sounds. So this, again, it is the muscle memory topic, but in a bit more detail. So let's say we've got our first pentatonic in A minor. The ultimate scale, the, the home for all guitar players. Now, if we take away the first string, which is the fifth and eighth fret on the low E, and I just focus on all the notes from the A string, and then I play the third shape of the minor pentatonic scale, they're the same notes. And they're almost in the same finger orientation. So when I realized that, that instantly made the third shape more accessible to me. So what that forced me to do then was if I'm playing first shape and I'm going to go, uh, let's say I'm going. I now know I can go in my third shape. So it instantly makes the third shape seem more accessible to me. The same is true with the second shape. If we take away those first two notes we play, then we have those notes, which is our fourth pentatonic shape, which then means I can play licks I play in the second shape in the fourth shape. Then where that habit goes even deeper, is if you have a lick in the first shape that connects to the second shape, I can now do that same lick between three and four. So for me, that was a big kind of eye opener with how the shapes connect and using them a little bit more intuitively. Um, yeah, just thinking about them from a sound perspective rather than a shape. 
like listen to the shapes. And also the other thing that really helped was just putting on a backing track and only improvising in a shape that I don't know that well. So I put on a track in A, and then I'm just gonna play in the third shape. And just stay in that one shape over the backing track and basically force yourself to learn how that shape sounds. Because one of the big things that's tricky is the shape is a little bit unusual. And the same is true for the fourth shape. Listen to the way they sound and then just, yeah, get used to using them. Try and listen to the ideas that you play. Um, obviously just make those connections in between. You can play licks in the first shape and the third in kind of the same form, the second and the fourth. That's one way I broke out of that box personally. So yeah, give that one a try. So what else have we got over there? Anyone else working on anything cool or anything they're stuck on at the moment? Anton is gonna get back to practicing vibrato after the live stream. Vibrato is really, it's fun to practice because it just kind of, um, yeah, it just kind of opens up how you sound as a player and it just, it is your identity as a guitar player. I think it's its how you sound and who you are really. So yeah, get, get a lot of practice in on that. And, Listen to how other players do vibrato as well. That was a big um, sort of eye opener in terms of like what would we what would we refer to it as sort of expression or articulation. Uh, listen to how your favorite players do vibrato, because if we have like someone like BB King, for instance, like I'm obviously speaking from a blues perspective, BB King's vibrato is very quick, so he would do this kind of quick narrow vibrato. <laughs> But then if you play more of a rock thing, you're not going to want to use that kind of vibrato. You're going to want to articulate the note with a wider vibrato. So listening to how different players approach vibrato is always interesting and trying to copy that too. That's always a good way to get a few new ideas on how you can use it. Why do they call it shapes? Good question. So the reason they call it shapes is because the guitar as, um, as an instrument, is actually, in my opinion, one of the easier instruments to learn theory connected to. And this is where the, the idea of shapes really fits into it. Because of the way the guitar is tuned, we can learn music theory as a way to drop our plectrum, but we can also <laughs> learn music theory as a series of patterns and, and shapes. So let's say I'm playing an A minor bar chord. That's a chord shape, because that shape of notes on the fretboard gives me a minor chord. So if I shift that chord shape to here, my fingers are in the same shape, but I'm just playing different notes underneath them. And it's now a C minor chord. Scales are the same. So if I put this pattern together, it's an A minor pentatonic scale, because the shape starts from an A. But if I take that same shape and I start it from a D note, it's a D minor pentatonic scale. So they're basically a collection of shapes that we can learn, or shapes or note patterns, or whatever you, whatever you want to refer to it as, but we can easily move those around. Now on other instruments, piano being one, the shape of each scale and each chord changes for every, every chord and every scale purely because of the layer of the notes, because a piano is very linear. So the distance between the notes dictates that the note shape changes because we're mixing black and white keys depending on where we are on the keyboard. But the guitar is laid out in a way that if we play something in one key, we can literally move that around to different keys without actually changing what we're doing. And that actually means as guitar players, we can learn things quicker and easier because let's say we're playing in A minor and I've got a lick. And then I show up to uh, a blues jam and the guy says, right, we're gonna do that today in D minor. All I've gotta do is move the shape of that lick to fit into a D minor scale. And I can play exactly the same lick. And I've not needed to relearn the lick or do anything crazy. I just moved the shape of it. So I guess that's where the, the theory of shapes comes from. But yeah, it's, it's just a, a slightly easier way, I think, to visualize things on guitar. and especially theory, like guitar is much easier to learn theory than other instruments in my opinion. So another question we had on social media 
was how to be better at solos. So I think this is uh, an interesting topic because this is a question that doesn't really have a straight answer. How to be better at solos really is a case of, first of all, setting your own expectation about what you expect or what you consider to be better at solos. So if it's a technique thing, if you find that you're playing solos and your technique is the thing letting you down, focus on that. Spend some time working on whichever technique it is that is slowing you down. So if it's alternate picking or if it's hammer-ons or pull-offs, work on those. If it's a creative thing, so let's say, you know, let's say I can't come up with interesting licks, then that's a different topic to address. So to get used to being more creative as a lead guitar player, you need to listen to things. So that's really the best way to to learn ideas is to expose yourself to loads of different types of music. Listen to how your favorite players approach things. Obviously, learn scale shapes. Listen to how your top five guitar players play that same scale shape in their own songs because chances are most players are gonna be using very similar scales. So look and listen to how they're doing it and then try and bring a little bit of that into your own playing. But then also take what they do and try and change it a little bit. So learn a classic lick and add a new note to it. And that can make your solos more interesting. It's, it's a very open-ended question, but yeah, there's a ton of stuff you can do from technique through to just listen more and expose yourself to new things that you've never heard before. Honestly, I only know about five scale shapes and about 15 chord shapes. I should learn more on the rest of the shapes and the scales I know part of. As long as you know minor pentatonic, you can get by. Um, but it is useful to learn more. It, it, I guess it just depends on, you know, what you want to achieve with that knowledge. I always teach music theory as what I refer to as practical music theory. So in my guitar course, this is the way that I set out theory because I know theory can be quite a, quite a daunting thing for a lot of players. And I know I was personally scared off theory for years. I learned how to play the first shape of the minor pentatonic scale and thought I knew everything, you know, that's that's all I need to know and everything else is just, you know, clogging up my brain with things I'm never going to use. But where I changed my mind is when I realised that theory can be practical and this is the way I've always taught theory. So think of scale shapes and chord shapes and, you know, theory concepts and chord progression ideas. Think of them as extensions of things you already know and, and just different options. So if you don't need to play jazz music, don't learn the theory of jazz because you don't need it. Learn, learn theory and learn scales practically. So if you only play rock and blues, just learn the, the stuff you need for that and really just get good at that. Don't fill your brain with things you don't need to know as a guitar player because I think there's too much pressure on people with theory to learn everything or nothing. There's No one really teaches you that, you know, you can learn some of it and you can use some of it, but you don't need to know it all. I personally know all of the modes because I teach them, but I don't use most of them in my playing because I don't need them. I use the ones that I need to use uh, because they're the ones that give me the results I want. So yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, just, you know, if, if you think you need to know more, more scale shapes or more chord shapes, ask yourself why. And if there's a purpose to learning it and a practical reason to learn it, then do it. That's always the way I look at it. Joseph, advice for how to be a good band member when you join your first band as a less experienced player. Oh, that's a really good one. Um, so, first of all, the best advice is just listen. Listen to what everyone else is doing. If you get the opportunity as a musician to play with musicians who are better than you, that is the best learning experience you can ever have. Uh, listen to how people play, but also the big thing for me as a player when I first started playing with bands was really kind of understanding what everyone's role in the band is. So instead of thinking of everyone as being, you know, everyone plays the same thing, think about how each player would play their instrument. And if you can, develop an understanding of what each player is doing with their instrument. So even if you don't ever play drums, Learn how drums work. Learn how rhythm works. Learn what a drummer would probably do. So learn, you know, what drums is he going to hit on your straight beats. If you're playing rock, he's going to be sitting on the kick and snare and he's going to be using the hi-hat probably. But then 
kind of learn where to expect drum fills and, and those sort of things because what that can do is that can make you plan what you're going to play around what he's doing because if you're trying to play a really complex guitar line and then all of a sudden the bass player is doing something crazy and the drummer starts doing something crazy then it just turns into you know a, a gigantic uh, soup of notes so my advice for being a good band member is to listen and understand what everyone else in the band is doing and also know what your role in the band is. So if you're playing with a pop band or a funk band, let's say you're playing funk, your job might just be to go You might just have to do that for three minutes. What you don't want to do is you don't want to go unless there's a call for you to do that. So yeah, it's just being aware of what the other musicians are expecting from you as well. And don't play something for the sake of playing it. I think it's an easy thing when you're a new player to playing in bands or a young player especially, you always want to be seen as the, you know, the best guy on the stage or the most talented guy on the stage. Especially guitar players, we're the worst for this. We always want to be the ones to be playing the cool licks and you know, Look at what I can do. But sometimes, and some gigs, that's not your role at all. So yeah, being aware of what your role is within the band is so, so important, I think. It's um, it's something a lot of people overlook. And it's the reason why you go and see some bands and it just looks like everyone's overplaying because everyone is just fighting for that space and no one is really respecting the song. Everyone's just trying to get their point across with you know, their technical ability. So what other topics did we get over there on Instagram? Uh, someone asked for guitarist analysis. So if there's any guitar players you guys would like to see us talk about in these in future streams, let me know because we could always do some streams on you know dedicated guitar player styles as well. Uh, what else have we got over there? Classic licks. How to improvise better, that's always a good one. We've already talked a little bit about that. Someone said all of the above. That's always quite a useful answer. Uh, I also had a request this week, actually. I don't know if the person that submitted this question is here. I don't think she is. But someone asked me on some advice on learning the Tenacious T song tribute. Uh, obviously... I don't know which part of the song you're stuck on, so if you are here, let me know. And if not, it's a topic we can chat about some other time. So it seems like a lot of people though want to talk about improvisation. That seems to be a big topic. So I think we've talked quite a bit about that, but if anyone has any other questions on that topic as well, obviously throw those in the comments. Let me know if you guys have got any other questions or anything else you want to talk about as well while we're on here. I think there's so many so many interesting avenues to go down, especially with scales and theory, isn't there? Always fun to know what people are stuck on as well. I think these kind of sessions, I think I'm probably going to do one of these a month. So obviously, I'll probably try and keep it maybe to the first Wednesday of each month. So obviously, if you guys have questions or things you want to talk about in a guitar educational sort of sense, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll do a committed session once a month on that as well. But yeah, it looks like everyone's been pretty busy with the learning, so let me know if there's anything else before we wrap up. I don't think I've got anything else coming in over on the socials. Nope. Uh, how to be better at solos we've talked about, what scales to use, improv advice, we've covered Eric Johnston, we've covered the pentatonic topic. Uh, where's my topics list gone? Yeah, classic licks. Classic licks is a good one because it's something that is really useful to know. I think it's worth learning classic licks because when we talked about creativity in one of the other questions a couple of minutes ago, classic licks can give you ammunition to form other licks. So if you know how, let's say, how Jimmy Page would approach a classic lick, you could learn one of his licks and then transform it into something that you would play as well. So learning classic riffs or classic licks is always a good thing to do as well. Can we talk about easy songs that sound complex? We can. 
easy songs that sound complex. That's always um, always a fun one. I always think that songs that are, I mean, I guess it depends what you define as easy, but there are songs that we can play that can sound more complex than they are. So if you've got a song, for instance, that is based around three chords, like the one that always pops to mind for me is Sweet Home Alabama. I've taught this quite a lot to to students and, and in videos and whatnot. Um, it's three chords, which on its own, if you just play those chords, it's pretty straightforward. But where it gets difficult, or where it sounds difficult, is when we start putting all the other stuff in. So yeah, that that's an interesting one, because if anyone has any favourite easy songs that sound complex, throw those in the comments as well, because that's uh, always a fun topic. Fun learning tunes for beginners. So yeah, beginner stuff, um, there's a ton of really cool stuff. When, when I was growing up, it was all about big rock riffs. So I always think that a lot of the the best riffs are, you know, they're not riffs that are crazy difficult. It can be things like one I learned a lot, uh, you know, when I first started with Sunshine of Your Love by Cream. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I think any classic riffs are always good for beginners. Uh, we've got, you know, the Stones, Satisfaction. Or the classic that I always teach beginners is Iron Man by Black Sabbath. Things like that are great as well, like big 60s and 70s rock riffs. They're never usually that difficult to play, but they sound great. And as a beginner, they always sound really impressive as well because people know those riffs. If you play something that people know, that always sounds really impressive because they know it. There's almost this perception that it must be hard to play because they've heard it before. Favorite overdrive for the Black Star Studio 10 6L6. Have you tried a Marshall in a Box style pedal with it? I have a bunch of favorite overdrives for that amp. Um, to be honest, I find that the Black Star Studio 10 pretty much takes anything. I'm actually using it right now as well. So the amp, the tones you're hearing are actually the Studio 10 going via the Captor X. Uh, in front of it right now, I have the Analog Man King of Tone. But actually next to that on my pedal board, I do actually have a Marshall in a box star pedal. I've got the MXR Power 50, which is like a, a JCM 800 sort of sound. It's the new Tom Morello pedal. And again, if I just kick that on, so obviously the amp itself, let me just go back to the amp, is completely clean. Super, super clean. Kick the Marshall in a box star on. Obviously I've not got much gain on that, but if I push the gain a bit. And turn my mic off so you don't hear the string noise. So yeah, it takes Marshall in a Box style pedals really, really well. It's a great amp for pairing with pedals, I think, because it just it's such a nice, easy platform to stack stuff on top of. I actually find it's probably the best amp I own for pedals. It pretty much takes whatever you need it to take. When you put like a Marshall style pedal in front of it, it doesn't make the amp sound like a Marshall, but it kind of takes you, you know, it kind of takes you on that journey. It adds a lot more of that sort of big fat British mid-range without it being too martial -y. It's a nice a nice compromise, I think. 
Tony Davis. I'm on the road today. Managed to catch a few minutes while I stopped to refuel. Cheers. Hey, Tony, good to see you. I uh, hope your journey is going well. And yeah, I'm sure you'll catch up on the stream at some point. But yeah, have a safe journey wherever you're going. Dennis, this is great learning for me today. And Kenny Wayne Shepherd at Hard Rock Cafe in Tulsa. I just had to brag. Do you know what? Kenny Wayne is an incredible player. I'd love to sit down with him and pick his brain on playing because he's such a good player. I love that he kind of takes the Steve Ray Vaughan thing and just, you know, just twists it a little bit to make it his own. He's one of my favorite players. I love his approach to sort of blues playing and phrasing. I think he's just, yeah, he's easily one of the best out there at the moment. Stone Temple Pilots is complex. St I'm assuming you mean Stone Temple Pilots when you say STP anyway. His Psycho Chords. I find stuff off Blessed Hellride Black Label Society fairly easy. Kazak had to sing, so nothing too complex. Do you know what? Black Label Society are a band that always evaded me. I've never actually really listened to them. I've heard like maybe two or three songs. Um, but I think it's because I'm not really a fan of Zach Wilde. <laughs> so I've sort of given them a bit of a, a wide berth. Um, but I agree with the Stone Temple Pilots thing. There's a lot of crazy diminished chords and really cool chord voicings in there as well. Uh, Anton, maybe play YouTube through the car stereo on Bluetooth. Sometimes I just have to listen this way if on the road. That would work, yeah. If you've got a Bluetooth um, a Bluetooth stereo in your car, you could listen. You could just listen to the audio and treat this like a guitar lesson podcast, I guess we could call it. That's an interesting way to think about it. I suppose the benefit of seeing it in a video is when we talk about things that, you know, when we're actually talking about specific frets or, or I'm showing you something, but yeah, just for discussing context, concepts, not context, you could just listen away and, and enjoy on the journey. Yeah. But yeah, cool. So I think I'm up to date over there on the questions. So anyone got anything else they want to talk about? What else are you guys working on? Let me know what your what your big guitar questions are. I'm working on uh, sort of finger dexterity at the moment because I've fallen into like really stale habits and I kind of feel like I'm playing, you know, the same 20 things all the time. So I'm really trying to make a conscious effort to get a bit more mileage out of my fingers when I play these days. Um, I'm working on like technique a lot at the moment because I kind of feel like, I know this is one of those really weird things now, because I play guitar every day because it's what I do for a job, but because I play every day, I don't practice every day. And since I started playing every day and not practicing every day, my technique has kind of slipped up uh, because I'm playing stuff every day that I'm comfortable playing and I'm not pushing myself. So yeah, I'm I'm in a bit of a weird loop as well. So actually these sessions are as much for me as they are for you guys as well because I actually want to steal some new ideas from people as well. I actually want to find out what other people are working on. So maybe there's something I'm missing in my own my own kind of practice routines because I've definitely fallen into some really bad habits over the last, you know, the last sort of 12 to 18 months where I'm just not practicing the right things anymore, which is really annoying because... I want to practice more, but I don't have the time to practice because I'm too busy playing, if that makes sense. So yeah, it's a really, really frustrating thing. Finger dexterity is something that I've completely lost over the last few years. Um, so I've started doing this new exercise that um, I've done a, I've, there's gonna be a full length video on this exercise over on the PMT YouTube channel, PMTV UK. They're a, a store chain in the UK that I do videos for. And I'm, I've just sent them a video this week, which I guess should be up by the end of the week, which is a new dexterity exercise that I've just sort of come up with. Uh, and maybe you guys will find this quite useful as well. So you know when we talk about finger dexterity, every guitar teacher always teaches you the four fingers in a row thing. We've all done that to death and it's not the most fun sounding thing. So what I've started doing is the same exercise, but focusing on pairings of fingers. So instead of doing five, six, seven, eight, or one, two, three, four, as it's usually written out, I'll just do five and six. So first finger and middle finger. But what I'm doing is I'm, the way I do this is I do a hammer on going up, 
and then I pick the notes on the way back down and then I go to my first and third finger pick on the way back down and then little finger and then I'll go to like my middle finger and my third finger so the sixth and seventh frets then the little finger and then the third finger and the little finger so yeah that's something I'm working on a lot at the moment as well just to get my my fingers back in technical shape because I've definitely lost a little bit of uh, my technical ability there Anton I've recently got the HX stomp but now realize I need to really put in some time to learn how to use it I'd rather just practice so it's not getting much use yet option paralysis yeah the helix has got so many options um, to be honest with you it depends what you're looking for from a helix but when I bought my my first helix um, the rack unit helix the first thing I did with it was I bought it because it has pretty much every option I could ever need and I thought well this is this is really cool this is a really cool thing to have in the studio I can use it for anything I want so I bought it it came the first thing I did with it was set up a patch which sounded exactly like my real rig so I used uh, the same sort of amp that I would use at a gig and I set up the same chain of pedals that I would use at a gig and then for six months I didn't do anything else with it I literally just recreated my live rig to use at home uh, and the only reason I ever started deviating from that was when I was doing different things where I was doing like sound alike videos or like creating patches for my web store where I would then kind of dive into other stuff um, I recently got the HX Stomp XL which I'm in the middle of doing a bunch of videos for Line 6 for and that is I dived into that probably more in the last month than I have in the three years I've owned my big Helix. Uh, but yeah, there are so many options. I think really it's just, for me, I'm not a very techy player. I'm not someone who really wants, you know, a thousand and one different options. Sometimes I just want one option. And that's the reason I love this Blackstar uh, Studio 10 6L6, because if you could see the top of the amp, it's got four controls volume gain tone and reverb it's not even a four it's not even a three band eq it's just a tone control i literally set the <clears throat> i think i've got the gain on like 30 percent of the way up on the clean channel the tone halfway and the master volume is like maybe just over three quarters of the way up because i'm going through the the two notes so there's no volume in the room um but that's it like the reverb is actually coming from a separate unit but I just love that simplicity of it. So when I play clean, I've just got this real simple tone. And there's just no fussing around. And that's kind of the way I set my Helix up. Just set up a good basic tone, chuck a couple of pedals in the chain and away you go. Because it is very easy to go really deep on how much you can tweak with that thing. Anna Cope, hi Lee. Anna, we were just speaking about your question. Um, I didn't go into too much detail because I didn't actually know which part of the song you were working on. So uh, you sent me the question on Instagram about the Tenacious D song tribute. Which part are you stuck on? Because, uh, yeah, I mentioned it and I didn't know if you were in the chat, but I can see you are now. So yeah, let me know what you're, what you're stuck on in the song and then we can dive into that as well. What's that there? So, okay. Ritka, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Ritka R. Hello, a beginner question. When learning guitar tab, is there any predetermined correct position for every finger, or is it possible to place fingers as you feel comfortable? That's a really good question. Um, this is something that I talk about a lot with, with students, is when you're reading guitar tab, there is essentially no um, no guide of what finger you should use so there are certain things that are predetermined like if there's a chord in the tab obviously we have a way that we would usually play that 
specific chord. But the rest of it is very much up to you. Um, let's say we're learning like a riff. Uh, let's say we're learning Seven Nation Army by the White Stripes. Right, really simple beginner riff. Loads of new players learn this riff. And the tab is written out, but the tab doesn't really tell us what to play. So I could play it all with one finger. Or I could use different fingers. And really the finger I use doesn't make a difference because it sounds the same. So in answer to that question, yeah, usually it's just whatever feels comfortable unless you're playing something that does need you to use specific fingers like a certain chord or maybe a certain pattern of notes would be you know better played with specific fingers um obviously the more you play and the more you go into that the easier it becomes to use your own judgment with that i usually say to people if you're uh if you're learning something from tab and you don't quite know which fingers to use try some different combinations and you'll find one that feels comfortable as a rule, if it feels uncomfortable, it's probably not the right thing for you. Dave Lewis, is the boating lake still in Swansea? Um, yes. I think you mean probably the one in the big park. Um, if so, I believe it is. Hannah, okay, yes. Just finished work looking at the intro and strumming pattern for the chords in the whole of the song. Okay, cool. So, I'm just going to bring up a tab on my other screen because it's been a long time since I saw the, the correct strumming pattern for that song. So the intro is based around an A minor chord. Testing my memory here while the tab loads. So one thing that, again, this is kind of a good follow-up actually to the, the question about guitar tab because if you looked at the guitar tab for this song it would show you single notes followed by chords, but the tab doesn't tell you that, uh, for some reason it won't load on my, my second screen, it doesn't tell you that there are a series of single notes that you play that are within the chord. So for instance, if you play in the intro of the song, I would always get my fingers into the A minor position, but the song starts with, is a little pitch run but those notes are actually within the a minor chord so if you were playing this purely by reading the tab it would be really easy to think you've got to go like that because that's what the tab tells you to do but really the, those notes can be played within the chord so again this kind of goes back to Ritka's question sometimes it makes more sense to use whatever finger and other times there is a predetermined way. So for you, Hannah, the answer would be get an A minor chord in place. So the intro um, would be around this chord shape. So this chord shape would be there for the whole thing. So you're gonna be going open on the D and doing a hammer on to the two and the same on the G, but that's within an A minor chord shape. Now you don't have to keep the chord shape pressed down, but as long as you're aware that it's within that shape for the ease of getting back to it, then you're gonna be hitting the A string and the D string, but within the chord. So it's kind of like a little quick phrase. If you were playing that single notes, it's like that, which obviously makes it harder than to get to the chord. If we think of it within the chord shape, we're already in place. So the strumming pattern is, I'm just sight reading this now to try and get it in my head. Uh, so it's one and, uh, I'm just sight reading rhythm now, which I haven't done in a while. Two and a three and a, so that's one and, one and two and a three and a, which are strummed. And then you're doing this little flurry then. So from the A minor chord, you're playing the A minor chord and hammering onto the third fret of 
the B string, which gives you a chord known as an A sus4. And then you're taking the first finger off and hammering back on. So you basically go in. And those four notes are played across the final beat of the bar. Four, E, and a. So again, it's all within that chord. So your rhythm there would be, if you're doing the pick notes, it'd be one and, then strum the chord, two and a, three and a, and then you're going four and with strums, but on those you're going, you're adding those extra hammer-ons. So slowly. Just like that, so hopefully that helps a little bit. It's quite a fun riff that is to play because it's within a chord, but yeah, it's there's some technical elements to that as well. And I think the strumming pattern, I'm just sort of skim reading the song now, but yeah, the strumming pattern kind of stays the same from what I can see for the rest of the song. You're doing that sort of one and a two and a three and a four. There's a couple of instances where the chords ring out, but that seems to be, you know, upon quick glance over the song, that seems to be more or less the strumming pattern that seems pretty consistent throughout the whole thing. So yeah, hopefully that helps a bit. Let me know how you get on with that. I was on that boat in Lake in the 60s when Manfred Mann had it. <laughs> I think it's still there. I think the, the boat in Lake is still there. Um, I've not been down that, that end of town for a while, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it... I can't see any reason why they'd get rid of it. Um, but yeah. Don't think Man From Man have had it since the 60s either, have they? They're not a band that you hear many people talk about these days. Although, the great Jack Bruce from Cream was once a member of Manfred Man. So, there's something to say there, isn't there? Uh, Anton, what song was that from again, please? That was, uh, that was from a song called Tribute by a band called Tenacious D, because Hannah wanted to learn that one. She was trying to work out the intro for that one, so that's from that song. That was just the first sort of couple of bars of guitar from that song. The, the original is obviously played on an acoustic as well, but I'm just playing it on a, on a clean electric for the purpose. Uh, Hannah, brilliant, thank you. I should give that a go or give that a try. Yeah, let me know how you get on. It's, it, it's a fun little thing because you're sort of going to be playing a chord shape that you already know, but you're doing things within that chord shape. So whether or not you keep the chord shape down for the first little bar. I always have done whenever I've played it. I've always just kept that kind of form there and then done the hammer on within that. And then you've got that little, that little phrase there, but you're playing that with the chords. So yeah, there's a couple of little technical things in there that make it slightly trickier. And again, that could even be considered one of those songs we were talking about earlier that sounds harder than it is. But it is, it's, it's fun. It's a fun one to play. Halls and love the mini tribute tutorial. <laughs> it's, it's one of those acoustic riffs that's always overlooked for people to learn, I think. It's, it's such a fun song. Um, admittedly, when that song came out, I'm old enough to remember when that came out first time round, and it did drive me mad a bit because it was always on. If anyone... Uh, was watching any of the music channels like 2002, I think that came out, they would know that that video was on every other song. So the first 3,000 times you heard it, it was quite funny. And then, <laughs> you know, it, it started to lose its shine. But retrospectively, it's, it's still a fun song. But at the time, it did get a little bit tiresome. But yeah, fun one to learn, though. So good luck with that. And... Fun fact for anyone who doesn't know, but Dave Grohl played drums on that. And the devil in the song is actually Dave Grohl. So if you see the music video, uh, the devil that crops up is actually Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. So that's always a fun little thing as well. He was very much involved with the whole Tenacious D thing from the very early stages. Because he's just one of those guys. He can do anything. Dave Grohl can literally do anything. But yeah. I think classic songs and classic riffs and licks and stuff, it's always a good a good topic for these kind of sessions as well. That's 
one of the things I mentioned earlier is that someone asked about classic licks. So if there's any classic licks people want to learn in future sessions like this as well, you know, we can definitely break some of those down. Um, because, yeah, like I said, for anyone who's joined in the last sort of little while, we, I'm probably going to be doing one of these every month now. So once a month I'm going to jump on here and, and the live stream is going to be committed to just, you know, talking about all things educational. So any guitar problems or questions there'll be a, a session once a month where we can address those such a classic tune i remember it first coming out i was watching crying when it was the most asked for video it really was the most asked for video and it was all the time <laughs> it was on all the time the pick of destiny the movie yeah that was i do you know what? i haven't seen that film pretty much since it came out i remember watching it like when did that come out like 2005 that was probably the last time I saw that film. But yeah, they, they were great songwriters. They they knew what they were doing and they knew the right way to sort of create something funny that still kind of spoke to people. So yeah, very clever, clever songwriting from those guys there. But yeah, the, I, can still, I, can, I can still remember the video for Tribute pretty much inside out as well. I, uh, I've seen it so many times <laughs> over the years. It's just one of those videos that you can't get away from. It must be pretty highly ranked on YouTube as well. I bet it's got quite a few views. But yeah, like I said, we're going to be doing one of these once a month. So anyone who has any questions or sort of things we're going to be working on, if you've asked a question in this session and you've had it answered, obviously come to the next one next month. I'll probably, you know, it's the second of the month today. So I'll probably aim to keep this up the first Wednesday of each month. That seems to make sense. Um, and then we can catch up once a month on this. There'll still be live streams in between, obviously. Um, there'll still be a, a weekly live stream, but we'll just be doing one uh, one committed educational live stream once a month. Uh, Dave Lewis has strangely had a message deleted there, and I don't know why. Uh, I can see your message, Dave. I don't know why it's automatically been deleted by the chat there. Um, Russian kids used to have x-ray sheets to make music. Yeah, I, that was uh, that was quite common. I think it was maybe like the tail end of the Second World War. There was a lot of places that couldn't get vinyl shipped. So what people used to do is they used to get old x-ray sheets when x-rays were printed on these sort of hard sheets, not on the sort of fit, like the thin film that we have these days. Um, and people would actually cut record like sort of vinyl records onto the sheets. They didn't they used to call them like it was something like Bones Records or something. There was they, they had quite a cool name, and you could like take this old X-ray sheet and put it in your record player and actually listen to music. Uh, but yeah, I don't know why you link. Uh, I don't know why that got deleted, Dave. Um, the streaming program didn't like that question. <laughs> it seems. Uh, I only saw it for the first time a few months ago. Love the intro to Wonder Boy as well. I I think I learned that years ago for a for a lesson but i can't remember it I, I i've taught a few tenacious d things over the years but yeah a lot of them escape me at the moment but they i've learned them all at some point i think it starts with an f chord maybe if my memory serves me right i can't remember though but yeah so yeah that was fun thank you very much guys um i think we'll probably leave it there now we've been we've been going for about an hour and a half now so yeah i think we've we've covered quite a bit of ground in this one so as i said first Wednesday of each month we'll do the same thing anyone has any questions things they want to learn or things they want to talk about we'll get on one of these streams and talk there'll still be other you know streams in between every other every Wednesday but they won't be educational focused just this one once a month will be so yeah thank you guys as always obviously there's a bunch of new content coming out very soon on the channel I've not been as present posting demo stuff lately I've got a huge backlog of videos I need to make. I've got like, you know, 18 videos in my queue, which will be going on the channel very soon. Uh, but I've been super, super busy over the last few weeks reshooting and editing content for my guitar course. So anyone who is learning and, and wants some additional, you know, guidance or advice, I've got a guitar course, which is linked down in the description, writenotesmusictuition.com. There is about 180 lessons on there at the moment but I've literally just finished shooting them all again in 4K uh, and I'm currently in the process of editing, you know, 
all the videos again. So that's why I've not been posting as many gear related videos on the channel because I've literally, I've literally spent the last two days sat at this desk editing audio, only audio. So it's driving me a bit crazy, but there's going to be a bunch of new 4K content on there soon. I've got a bunch of other stuff planned as well. So yeah, if, if you're learning and you want to check that out as well, there's some links down below in the description where you can check that out too. And obviously the support via the guitar course and all the links down below helps support the channel as well. And it obviously allows me to keep, keep doing this and keep pushing forward and making as much content as I can. And I am going to be working my way through my huge backlog. I've got like nine pedals sat there next to me and a bunch of other stuff that needs to be demoed for the channel so there's plenty of gear stuff coming up for you guys as well uh in the meantime go check out all the rest of it go check out some of those links down below as well if you want if you've got some time go give some of those things a click and yeah i'll speak to you guys next wednesday again i'll be back next wednesday same time for another live stream don't know what the topic is going to be yet so if there's anything you want to see me talk about live next wednesday let me know the the other live streams are completely open to interpretation at the moment. But yeah, I'll see you guys very soon. Thanks for watching as always.